Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Scripps Technical Forum. I'm Douglas Alden and I'm the lead engineer with the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes at Scripps. In addition, I function as the STF's uh, chair and get assistance setting up and running STF for my colleagues here on campus, Vanessa Scott and Ken and Purdy. Vanessa is Director of Corporate Affiliates and Innovation and Kevin is an Industry Relations and Innovation Analyst. If you've missed any of our recent presentations, you can find them on the Scripps Technical Forum playlist on the Scripps Oceanography YouTube channel. And uh, please know that today's presentation is being recorded. You have all been muted when you logged into the conference. If you have a question during the presentation, you can post it using the Q&A function in zoom or raise your hand and we will unmute you um we're gonna for for if you want to uh ask your question verbally we're gonna hold those questions to the end but please do use the q a function to uh record your questions as they come up uh today's presentation is on wide area color image mapping systems and will be presented by brendan st john from Boyas. brendan is a global technical sales manager Ocean Science at Voice Imaging Incorporated has been with the organization for the past four years. His background in electromechanical engineering and project management has allowed him to extend his expertise across multiple blue economy segments, including offshore energy, ocean sciences, and maritime defense. In his current role, Brendan's focus is working closely with academic and ocean science organizations to identify areas where optical solutions support critical research initiatives in areas such as mapping marine protected areas, digitizing marine archaeology, monitoring ecosystem health, and much more. So with that, we can hand it off to Brendan. Thanks, Douglas. And I'm just going to pull up my presentation now, and I'll kind of walk everyone through it. Um, as Douglas mentioned, please, yeah, if you can uh, hold verbal questions to the end, and um, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A session there. And if there's anything that filters through afterwards, I can always respond. Uh, I can reach out to you via email or, or anything like that. So during the presentation, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to turn off my video because I find sometimes it lags with uh, some of the data sets number that I'm going to show you. So. Okay, yeah, so uh, as Douglas mentioned, uh, my name is Brendan St. John. I work for a company called Voice Imaging Inc. Um, and we specialize in underwater laser scanning and stills imaging solutions, uh, primarily from dynamic platforms. And today I'm gonna focus on uh, how we go about this um, using our imaging systems to do wide area color image mappings. So just a quick agenda, um, I'll touch on who we are uh, as a company and uh, within a greater group. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of the, the actual hardware because obviously it's important to know um, the systems we're using to uh, collect this type of data. Uh, and then I'll give you kind of a, a more technical overview of the actual sensors themselves and how we go about some of the, the processing of the data, uh, what the data can actually be used for and, and why our approach to the the color uh, mapping from dynamic platforms is uh, different than maybe some other um, sensors out there that are currently being used. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, Q and A at the end, um, and feel free to to answer, ask any questions. Um, I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't have the answers, I can always reach out afterwards and uh, provide you with answers once I've I've got the feedback. Yeah, so a little bit about us. Um, essentially, in a nutshell, uh, we provide imaging solutions for subsea vehicles that, pro uh, that provide optimized data for uh, survey visualization, photogrammetry, and machine learning. Um, so essentially, we provide uh, top of the line sensors that collect the best data possible uh, to provide to the end users to do uh, what they see fit with it. Um, it's a variety of applications, kind of everything and anything you can think of. So um, stuff like photogrammetry, mosaic and machine learning uh, purposes, all that stuff can be done with our data. So just a little bit about our team. Um, we are based in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Uh, so for those of you who don't know where that is, it's, it's about 40 minutes outside of Toronto. Um, the reason why we're based here is uh, primarily because one of the best engineering schools in Canada is uh, in Waterloo, and we uh, poach a lot of talent from there. Um, I think about 70% of our staff is from the University of Waterloo, and uh, I think 
about 90 to 95 percent of us all have backgrounds in engineering um so we were the first dynamic laser scanner on subsea vehicles and uh now we are part of the covalia group um so just a little bit about covalia group um formerly sonardine group uh they provide they've been in the subsea industry for ooh, 50 plus years um and each company kind of has their specialty so voice we do the optical sensors um underwater laser scanners and stills imaging um sonardine group uh, who i think has done actually a lot of work with scripts as well um, provide underwater uh, comms and positioning sensors um seismic sensors uh wavefront does uh um, a lot of the sonar based systems uh, chelsea technologies focuses more on environmental sensors water quality um, stuff like that uh, forces is our defense branch and iva is a, a software um, that kind of combines all the solutions yeah so just um as Douglas mentioned, my focus is on ocean science. Um, however, we are involved in uh, offshore oil and gas, offshore renewables, defense in the civil uh, infrastructure markets. Um, some of our big partners within the ocean science industry are obviously uh, Scripps, NOAA, University of Tasmania, uh, USM, UC San Diego, and it kind of goes on from there. So how do we help? Well, essentially our sensors uh, provide data to enable autonomy on uh, dynamic platforms. So whether that is laser data, stills data, um, we can provide real-time enhancements and corrections with that data, which can then in turn be used for uh, various purposes, uh, real-time automatic, auto automatic target recognition. Um, it can aid in the nav navigational sensors on board the vehicle, um, and it can automate in uh, data workflows. So machine learning, uh, identifying objects underwater, um, stuff like that. So how do we go about this? Um, so essentially, we look to provide our sensors on dynamic platforms. That's really our specialty, kind of our bread and butter. Um, so we kind of go about it two ways. Our, our primary focus is AUVs and ROVs, uh, though we have done things from towed bodies, um, from USVs, surface vessels. Um, but especially with the, the work we're doing with Scribs right now um, is centered around uh, the AUVs, so the, the Remus 100s and 600s, and uh, soon to be a, a Remus 3000 vehicle as well. So yeah, these are kind of our payloads, uh, our recon payloads. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you'll see our stills imaging payload, and this is actually exactly what is on uh, the Remus 100. And then we have a slightly bigger light bar that is on the Remus 600. Uh, and then three more of these systems will be delivered in the, the next couple of months. Um, and those are essentially just modules that can pop right onto the vehicle. They're plug and play, um, and they're used to collect stills imaging data. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is actually one that is working with Hui and NOAA, uh, and it's a combined laser and uh, stills imaging module. Once again, it just pops on plug and play. Um, and you're good to go. Uh, one of the advantages and, and one of the reasons why uh, engineering backgrounds and engineering as a whole is so important within our company is the fact that um, we can really configure our systems in, in a lot of different ways. And this has allowed us to be on uh, almost every AUV in the market actually right now. Um, and it's because we provide a whole bunch of different solutions for integrating our systems uh, onto and into vehicles. Um, so I won't I won't really go through these in depth. Um, they're all iterations of kind of our same observer camera, uh, just in different form factors. Um, so two of these are actually uh, on the vehicles with scripts right now, uh, one being our observer complete, which is just our, our observer camera, um, which includes all the electronics in the back of the system as opposed to a separate control bottle. Um, and then the observer recon, and that one is also being used on the, the Remus 100 vehicle. Um, and once again, everything housed within that module that can just plug and play into the vehicle um, and, and utilizes all the power and comms through that. Uh, finally, we're able to get kind of in some really small vehicles. Um, I think the, the smallest AUV one right now is about 17 centimeters. Uh, and how we go about that is our uh, OEM package where we don't have the housing. It's all based on the, the pressure of the hull. Um, the pressure vessel of the hull, and that's what provides us with our depth rating. Um, but it saves a lot of space within the vehicles where space is limited. Um, and a lot of the time in small vehicles, uh, that, that tends to be the case. Our lighting options. So when it comes to stills imaging, um, 
kind of the, the, the model, the theory is you can never know, have enough light. Um, we have found that uh, the more light, the better. And this is just based on uh, how dynamic imaging works. Um, and it's essentially as much light uh, in a short period of time. So very short exposure time for the camera and just pumping out a lot of light. Um, so as you can see here, um, we've got various lighting options. And once again, the reason why we provide a whole bunch of different options is just because uh, every vehicle tends to be different. Every vehicle has uh, different space within. Um, and therefore we've kind of got to work around the parameters of the vehicle to try to um, optimize uh, lighting output and space uh, on the vehicle. So um, what you'll see is this Nova Recon in uh, uh, second from the right uh, is an externally mounted uh, panel. This is what is being used on both the, the Remus vehicles with scribs right now. Um, and it's uh, neutrally buoyant, um, doesn't cause any issues with the actual vehicle in terms of how it flies. Um, and that one there has 32 or 16,000, uh, 16 LEDs, which pump out roughly about 250 to 500,000 lumens. Um, we've got our flat panels that can pump out 350,000 lumens each. And typically two of those will go on a, an AUV or an ROV. So you're about 700,000 lumens. Um, and then we've got our kind of our OEM ones, which are smaller, uh, not as much light output, um, but they save space on the vehicle as well. And I'll, I'll go more into why lighting is important and space and the technical behind it um, in a little bit. I've got a, a whole section on that, um, but it's just important to see the different configurations because that is uh, very important when it comes to uh, doing any sort of dynamic imaging. Uh, lighting is, is one of the most important factors. Um, so this one here is just kind of an example of uh, what we call our discovery camera. It's essentially the same sensors as our um, observer cameras, which are intended for uh, larger ROVs and, and AUVs. Um, this one is actually designed to replace the camera, the piloting camera on uh, smaller ROVs. So stuff like the Video Redefender, the Deep Trekker vehicles, Saw Falcons, um, vehicles that typically don't have uh, a great imaging option uh, or great modeling options. Um, because of the size of the vehicle, they're usually very limited in the type of sensors they can get on board. Um, they might be able to get a, a small sonar system. Um, we've designed a, a laser scan and an imaging skit that can pop on the bottom of most of them. Um, but this will give these vehicles an option for um, one, using our camera to pilot the vehicle, uh, but two, to actually collect uh, high resolution stills images um, in real time, uh, with a, a dome and a fisheye, so wide 90 by 90 field of, uh, field of view, uh, as well as pumping out 150,000 lumens. Uh, each one of those LEDs is actually 75,000 lumens. Um, and then what can be done with this data? Uh, obviously, you can take this kind of data, so that this stills data for uh, photogrammetry, mosaic, and stuff like that. Uh, and then in conjunction with that, um, the same premise, replacing um, sensors on board smaller ROVs um, to provide them with modeling options would be our discovery. So it's a, a stereo offering. Um, and, and once again, it's almost the, the same kind of features as the discovery cam. Um, it's got the, the piloting options, low latency um, video uh, in real time. So it, it aids in the piloting. Uh, and then obviously it's got the, um, the option for SLAM as well. Uh, once again, I, will, I won't focus too much on the hardware. Uh, if you do want to learn more about the hardware, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after, but um, I think we want to kind of get to the, the, the more of the technical stuff. Um, and this is just a, a quick example of kind of the data you would get in real time with, um, with stuff like SLAM, so with a stereo camera. Um, and then obviously this can be refined in post. Yeah, so uh, let's focus a little bit on the actual uh, the actual technology and kind of how we go about um, doing our, our um, process. And so some of the key features with our imaging systems that uh, differentiate them from other stills imaging systems on the market. Um, so we do real time onboard uh, image processing. Um, so this means we do uh, even illumination uh, across the entire image. Um, color correction and debaring of the actual image itself. Uh, this in turn provides you with the data. Uh, either in real time when you are 
um, tethered to the, to the vehicle. Or uh, if you're on an AUV, for example, you pull the data from the onboard hard drive uh, once the vehicle has surfaced or been recovered. Um, all of these are quite important when trying to get data at high speed. Um, that's a big challenge when these AUVs are going, let's say, four to five knots potentially. Um, one of the biggest challenges is obviously trying to get crisp stills image that don't have blur. Um, all of that's quite important when you are looking to do applications like photo mosaic you know, or, or photogrammetry with stills data. Yeah, so this year is uh, kind of focusing on one of the key elements to our imaging systems. Uh, one thing we tout is uh, what we call our true color. Um, and this is essentially a proprietary set of algorithms that we use to correct our images uh, based on what the true color of the environment, uh, environment would be if the, uh, the water wasn't impacting the, the image. So if the hue of the water wasn't included in the, uh, the actual image itself. Um, and so the ones on your left-hand side, the four on the left-hand side, the ray, the shark, and the, the wreck, uh, those were actually done from the, the Scripps Remus 600. Um, as you can tell, they're, they're quite good images. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of data uh, that can be shared from, from the work Scripps is doing. Um, a lot of it can't be shared. Uh, so these are kind of limited data sets. And then on the right is just a couple from other projects we've done. Um, so some shipwrecks and some pipelines and stuff like that. Uh, and so, like I said, the, the key to this uh, at vehicles at any speed is, is really evenly illuminating the, the, um, the image. Uh, and I'll get more into that in a, in a second, but that's how it allows for crisp imaging um, and allows to actually pull, pull out the true color. Uh, and once again, I'll expand on how we actually get true color because it's easy to say, um, hey, look at these color images, but what's the process in which we uh, apply to the data to actually correct for the, the color? Yeah, so by gaining the highest quality uh, imaging data, um, so even illumination across the entire uh, image, um, you can create consistent mosaics. So something like this is a, a mosaic that uh, has done with a third-party software uh, and is able to, uh, to, to look so good and have such high quality because uh, each individual image is of that quality. Um, without that, if you're using a third-party software to create mosaics or photogrammetry models, um, you might see gaps or, or a slight misalignment in the data. Um, and that's because there, there might be blur or dark, pop, uh, dark spots on the, um, the edges of the, the, pics, uh, the pictures, um, which create difficulties for the software to properly align everything. Yeah, so this is just one of the, uh, the examples of uh, mosaicing that can be done with our software using, or with our, um, with our images, uh, typically done with kind of a third-party software, um, and you feed the images into that, that software uh, to be able to form a, an image mosaic, a map, would you have uh, whatever you're looking at. So the target or the large area that you're looking at. Um, the way in which we do this, aside from just having really high quality images, is the fact that all of our images can be uh, geotagged. So if there's positional sensors on the vehicle, uh, we can actually apply that positioning data to the, um, the image data and the metadata, and that will then in turn also aid the, um, the photogrammetry uh, mosaic and software in aligning the, um, the images in, in a really accurate manner. Uh, this is a, a really good example of, um, as you saw when all the images were flying in, uh, how seamlessly the images uh, paired together. Um, I've got an example of it here. Uh, so this one is, I think, about six images, and you can't really uh, see the difference of one uh, where one starts and one finishes, um, and that's just an testament to the, the quality of each individual image, and, and that's why it's important that each individual image uh, be processed on its own, uh, and um, when doing dynamic scanning, um, to really have that, that strong light um, and crisp uh, images. Yeah, and finally, um, an example of kind of some of the photogrammetric work that once again can be done with our data um, and, and kind of everything I've said so far about the quality of the images uh, really plays into this as well. And, and photogrammetric work is where you will find uh, it quite important to have um, georeference for the images. Um, it's what helps it kind of give its depth.
So all these processes are really just um, when we're talking about wide area coverage mapping uh, lend to that. So whether you're doing, uh, whether you want to use the data for mosaicing, uh, photogrammetry, or just individual analysis, um, this is how you would do it. You would utilize a dynamic platform uh, that can cover wide areas while collecting high resolution data, which can then be um, formed into to maps um, for, for further analysis, obviously, or, or comparative analysis over time. So kind of more in depth about what we actually do to our images uh, and why they're so good. Um, so one of the big things is our image correction. Um, and, and this is done real time on board the sensor um, so that the data can be utilized right when it's pulled from the AUV or utilized as it's collected with the ROV. Um, so what we do first is we take a, a, a raw image um, as you can see on the left-hand side there, and, and this is with the scrib stuff. Um, and then we undistort and debare the actual image itself. And then we apply the, the color and lighting. So uh, obviously it's taken with color or with lighting, um, but we have to process it and, and provide the even illumination across the entire image uh, and then do the, the color correction for that image as well. Um, so this is done without any input parameters. Uh, and like I said, it's all done in real time. Um, what we do with the image output is we provide both the, the raw image um, as well as the uh, color corrected JPEG image. Um, so both data sets are available uh, when pulling from the, uh, the AUV or from the, uh, the ROV. Uh, it's important to keep both. Uh, we, we get a lot of questions. Um, do you need to keep the raw uh, if, um, if you've got the processed images? And, and yeah, we always suggest it's important to keep the raw uh, for a couple of reasons. And, and one of them I'll touch on later is, is how we actually go about correcting the, the images. Um, but just in case there's any sort of malfunction or anything with the equipment, um, you've got that raw and it's easy to then um, apply the, the correct algorithm, algorithms afterwards. Um, additionally, uh, we continuously work at correcting our algorithms and, and improving them um, and being able to provide a, a software update uh, via just a push to the, the user, um, you can then go back and reprocess old data sets under the new algorithms, um, which is key to uh, if you didn't have the raws, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. So this is kind of the process in which we uh, go about correcting our images, uh, um, the color correction. So essentially uh, within the water, um, certain wavelengths travel further uh, and certain are absorbed un unevenly. Um, so essentially blue and green travel a little bit further within the water, um, whereas reds don't travel as far. Uh, and it's typically why you'll see that, that blue and green hue within your images. Um, so what we actually do is uh, we train our algorithms based on the data collected within a specific environment. Uh, and as it's collecting data, um, the more data it collects, the better training it is, it's doing to learn uh, what is the true color within that environment. Um, so it's uh, essentially what we wanna do is feed it in consistent images and it will correct via the learning process without a manual adjustment. Um, so uh, the more data you collect within an environment, the better it's gonna be uh, to the correction model. Um, and, and so as you can see here on the, the top is just kind of a, a GoPro um, of the same target. And then on your bottom here is uh, our observer camera uh, that uh, an image taken from our observer camera that has been run through our correction algorithms. Uh, as always, uh, lighting plays a huge role again in this. else that we find is uh, very important when it comes to imaging and uh, is overlooked a lot of the time. Um, and, and for anyone who's interested to kind of learn a bit more, we white paper about all of this they can send over afterwards as well, um, is uh, the dynamic range of the, the camera itself. Um, so a lot of the time people are very focused on, um, the, let's say the megapixel of the camera. Oh, it's a, it's a 4k, it's a, a 12 megapixel camera, um, which is good, but it isn't the be all and end all. And in fact, uh, there's a lot more to it that goes into it than just what are the, the megapixels of a camera. Uh, and we found that bit depth plays a, a huge role in it. So as you can see, um, these are some of our enhanced images. So the, the raw on the left, um, and one was taken with a eight bit camera um, and one was taken with a 12 bit. Um, so the key here is uh, within the pixels, you'll have different levels. 
and, and the 12 bit provides uh, far more levels uh, per pixel. Um, why is this important? Because it actually lets you one pick out finer details within the images itself. Um, as you can see on the, the middle image, um, you don't, it, it helps reduce um, and limit that blur around the edges that you would get. Uh, and then when it comes to color imaging, it actually helps pull out colors a lot better too, because you've got those various levels within the pixel that you're actually evaluating as well, as opposed to just uh, kind of a limited set. Um, and then it, it, and it's not any different in monochrome as well. Um, it highlights the, the discrepancies, the differences within the image, um, as you can kind of see in this one. So um, that's something that we have found has actually played a, a very big role um, in our imaging system. One of our uh, a larger cameras, so our Observer Pro, um, it's got a greater range, um, but the, the sensor on board is only five megapixel. Um, but this is a, a camera that was used on two very high profile shipwreck scans. Um, and the results are better than um, uh, one of the eight megapixel cameras on board the, um, the vehicle itself. And it's simply because it's got a greater dynamic range. Um, this also plays a role when you're trying to do further distances, um, imaging from further distances, it, it helps immensely. And then, so one of the other major factors when uh, doing our correction algorithms is the, the image on distortion. Um, so obviously, when you're doing any sort of underwater imaging, uh, you're going to have a warped image, and that's just um, common with the, the lens and the, the water distortions. They're both going to play a role uh, in kind of warping that image that you're, pick, uh, you're, you're uh, taking a picture of. Um, so the key to being able to actually properly, uh, properly analyze um, any sort of image to then use in um, mapping purposes is to undistort the image. Um, so this is kind of a, a trivial example, but it, it gets the point across um, pretty well that uh, you need to undistort the image so you don't have that warping if you want it to be able to align properly. Um, so we undistort the images using camera calibration parameters. So it's a, a whole internal proprietary process that we go through when uh, being able to calibrate the image and using that data to apply it uh, via the algorithms to the images collected. Um, obviously, there's a, a bit more that goes into that. I, I can't fully explain because uh, it's one of the things that makes our uh, sets our senses apart, um, but it is part of that uh, image correction process that I've been talking about, which is really what um, differentiates our, our images from a lot of the, the others out there. Um, so when we were showing you kind of the, the stuff that can be done with our systems, the mosaic and the photogrammetry, um, this is a, a huge factor in that to be able to actually align images correctly um, and not see gaps in the data uh, and not seeing misalignment or anything like that. This is another really big uh, important factor when trying to get uh, crisp imaging um, without any sort of blur and backscatter um, in the data. So we've kind of done a lot of testing with this and uh, not only have we found that pretty much pumping out as much light as possible is one of the biggest factors. Um, light separation is another big one. Um, you, don't you don't want the light um, too close to the camera, because what you end up doing is um, illuminating all the turbidity or particulate in the water uh, and creating kind of backscatter or uh, we're from Canada, so we call it snow in the water. Um, but it just creates uh, really bad pictures because uh, any sort of particulate, anything in, in the, um, the water column is, is really just getting illuminated and creating um, reflections off the particulate. And uh, there's a perfect kind of example of that there. Um, so what we actually do with our imaging systems, which a, a lot of people don't do, is uh, we like to configure the LEDs within the LED panel based on the placement of the light uh, on the vehicle in relation to where the camera is. Um, so essentially what we do is obviously we calculate those angles of the field of view of the camera and the, uh, the illumination field of view uh, in the overlap region. So with uh, with almost every vehicle, for the most part, you will have uh, an individualized LED panel. And that's just basically because uh, with every integration, your camera and your LED might be separated at different distances or different orientation. Um, so a way we can combat that is by uh, actually adjusting the, uh, the individualities within the LED panel to be angled differently. 
Um, and that all goes through the, the integration process, the technical talks, the engineering meetings uh, between uh, us and the end user. And that's to optimize the light output for the, the camera uh, placement on the vehicle. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the LED panel being used for the Scripps Rima 600 uh, though they're uh, and the 100, though they are um, both externally mounted and look very similar, the internal LEDs itself will actually have slightly different angles to them, uh, and that's because uh, the spacing on the vehicles is slightly different of where we've put the camera on one versus the other, um, and, and that makes a huge difference. Um, typically, like we, we will, uh, like. We, we like to say that if you can have one to two meter separation um, between the, the LED and the, the camera, that's what we see as kind of the, the optimal and where we get our best results. Your, your camera focus and uh, the actual um, sensor itself and, and how it's used. So uh, a lot of the time, uh, cameras underwater will just kind of be a, a standard camera put into um, an underwater house and a pressure house um, component. And uh, so it does stuff like autofocus, which is not compatible with any sort of dynamic imaging. Um, it results in uh, blur. Uh, it results in um, blurry edges, just not focused images. Um, whereas what we do is we use the fixed focus lens. Um, so you get the, the consistent focus across the field of view, uh, and you actually get the, the wide depth of field as well, which is what allows us to scan it, uh, sorry, image at different distances. Um, one of the other big things is we use a, a global shutter. Um, so you're not just continuously taking images, you're taking a, uh, individual images, um, and you won't see the blur in them. Uh, it's, it's almost like if you try to take a, a picture with your iPhone out of a moving car, um, you'll see um, you'll see a lot of blur in it, um, and that's because it's not intended to obviously do dynamic imaging, uh, and it's best that a, a, at that point a global shutter be used. Yeah, so kind of coming, coming near the end of it, but um, some of the applications we focus on, and, and like I said, my expertise is in the ocean science space as a uh, wide area mapping. Um, and uh, marine archaeology, and this can be done once again from ROVs or AUVs. Um, uh, we do full digital representations of historic sites. So as I mentioned, we just recently finished uh, two um, pretty big wrecks, uh, and we'll release the data soon, but right now we, uh, we cannot be releasing that. Um, and then benthic habitat and coral monitoring. So uh, we're currently working on a really cool project with uh, DFO in Canada, so the Department of Fisheries. Um, and it's uh, in conjunction with um, a couple other companies um, for the purpose of uh, long-term habitat monitoring. Um, so we've uh, equipped a cellular AUV with our uh, laser and imaging systems. And the plan is to uh, monitor uh, sponge reefs um, using a, a couple of different sensors. So there'll be a sonar system on there. There'll be the, the laser and still system on there to build out models. Um, and, and the goal is to be able to monitor over time the change um, based on the, the data that's been collected using our sensors. Um, so this will be a, a cool one to kind of test out uh, what we can see. So one of the big things that we, we've noticed obviously with coral is um, obviously that's where color imagery can really uh, play a role and be beneficial. Um, obviously, a lot of the time with coral, uh, color is a representation of health. Um, so if you have the true color of the image, um, that can really tell you uh, what, what's going on in the habitat, if, uh, if it's getting better, if it's getting worse. And, and that's kind of what we're uh, looking to prove out on this, this project with the Department of Fisheries. Um, and then this last one is more kind of laser focused, but we do a lot of flume tank and, and lab-based inspection work as well. Thing to touch on with uh, with that coral project or with the um, DFO project is uh, we're actually working in conjunction with um, University of Southampton and a, a group up there who are using our systems on their AUV um, to uh, do what we call kind of image clustering, uh, and that's utilizing uh, a data set of images which can be. I mean, depending on how wide area, uh, how wide the area is that you're mapping, uh, you can collect 35, 50,000 images. Um, and it's to find a more efficient way to parse through the data 
without having to analyze every image. Um, so what Blair and his team have done at the, the University of Southampton, uh, they've developed some algorithms that can actually essentially detect and cluster uh, like objects within massive data sets. Um, so it'll learn from uh, an individual image or a series of image and then cluster or group those images all together. Um, so that if you were looking to, let's say, uh, identify or analyze a certain species of fish within an environment or within a large area that you've mapped, um, you can then focus on that specific group that's been pulled out of the data set as opposed to having to analyze every individual image um, that was obtained. Um, and, and it all goes back to the, the quality of the images that are being um, that are being collected because without the, the high resolution images, uh, the crisp images, uh, these processes wouldn't work as efficiently as they do now. So finally, kind of a, a little bit of a recap, um, why voice? Uh, one of the big things for us is uh, the configurability um, that we offer, whether it's in AUVs, ROVs, um, being able to work with the client to uh, provide them with a solution that works best for uh, one, their vehicle, and two, for the application that it's focused on. Um, uh, suitable for a variety of deployments. So as I mentioned, we're kind of in a, a variety of spaces and uh, whether it's um, offshore oil and gas, offshore renewables, defense, ocean science, um, the systems can be utilized for a variety of reasons and within a um, one specific industry uh, can be utilized for a whole bunch of different applications as well. So the, uh, the versatility of them. Um, they help monitor and map underwater environments. I think that's kind of been the premise of this whole presentation. Um, they provide you with insight into environments that uh, typically you can't get with, let's say, a, a sonar-based system. Um, sometimes with uh, even a laser system, there's advantages to, to all the systems, but um, we provide you with a, a very good understanding of, of what you're looking at and what you're hoping to, to analyze underwater. Um, the real-time uh, data. So. The real-time processing of the images uh, saves you time on board the vessel. Um, you can pull data right away and use it as opposed to having to wait for it to be fully processed. Um, obviously, this saves you time when you, uh, if you have to go back out again uh, to collect something potentially you missed. Um, in the end, it, it really helps save time and money. Um, the support, so we like to really, uh, as I mentioned, we like to really partner with our, our um, the people we're working with. So uh, I think our, our partnership with Scripps has been a perfect example. Um, myself and Bob have been working together for two or three years now um, on, on a variety of projects. And uh, we actually just recently talked about a new one coming up that was um, something we had never thought about, but something we're very excited to, to see if our systems are capable of achieving. Um, and, and this wouldn't have come about if we hadn't uh, developed such a close partnership with Bob, who, uh, who felt confident to bring us this application. Um, so it's, it's really something that we, we pride ourselves on um, and providing that support to ensure the user is um, getting everything they want out of our systems and it's working for them uh, as they need. And then, yeah, uh, kind of enabling automation. So, um, Something that we're, we're really big on is uh, providing hardware to the user that can collect the, des the best data possible, um, which allows the end user in turn to do what they want with it. Um, I see this a lot in the ocean science space. Um, there's a ton of applications and a ton of use cases for our data that um, we had, had never really thought of until the, the user told us either they were looking to do that with our system or, um, they were using our system and came about a, a new way to, to use the data. Um, and, and this is because we want to um, provide the user with the best quality data possible. Uh, we don't want to pigeonhole anyone into being forced to use certain softwares or, or certain systems. Um, we just want to provide them with the best data possible to then utilize how they wish to use it. Yeah, so I think I, mean, I think we're pretty good on time here. I, I might have gone through that a bit quick, but um, if anybody has any questions or anything, um, yeah, please uh, please reach out now, uh, or I can uh, I can follow up with anyone who has questions afterwards. Like I said, um, I also have. Um, a white paper that goes a, a lot more in depth and a, a lot more technical about this subject than, uh, than I provided here today. Um, so I can also provide that to anyone who reaches out um, and I'll start my video again. 
So, Brandon, thanks for that presentation. And <laughs> we do have some questions that came through in the registration link. Um, the first one was, how well can this technology function in shallow but turbid waters or in habitats with high velocity or vertical structure of kelp? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, your yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so it's an optical-based system. Um, and because of that, whether it's our laser or still systems, um, turbidity can cause an issue. Uh, shallow water doesn't technically, or it doesn't tend to be a, an issue. Um, with our lighting, and, and as I mentioned, with imaging in general underwater, um, we want as much light as possible. Typically in shallow water, you get a lot of ambient light, which is fine. We can obviously um, utilize that in our systems. Uh, we can account for that in our software. Uh, we can adjust the LED output to account for that. Um, turbidity, yeah, um, I think I showed a couple images. Uh, turbidity will reflect particulate. Um, it's not the be all and end all. Um, or sorry, reflect light. It's not the be all and end all, but it does cause issues with any sort of optical system. Um, if, if you can't really see the target, uh, you're not going to get a great image of it, um, no matter how much light you put out at that point. We, I mean, you can always uh, fly closer. Um, therefore, there's less in the water column before you actually uh, target the image. Um, but yeah, turbidity is, uh, with any optical system, will always kind of be a challenge. Um, so I, I hope that answered that one. Great. But well, we got, uh, got one hand raised, but we, got, we have a question came in before that, and it's uh, um, from Denise, and she's a graduate student here at Scripps, and she works primarily with coral reefs in the Philippines. Your company's work is really important, especially with monitoring recovery of reefs after coral bleaching events, storm damage, et cetera. Do you have projects around the coral triangle as well? How do you make this technology more accessible to developing countries? Are you open to partnerships? Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on all of those. Um, so we don't have projects around the Coral Triangle yet. Um, we are hoping to have more surrounding coral soon, just any sort of coral soon. Um, it's something that I've been pushing hard for recently. Uh, I'm not sure how much Bob collected recently with his system. Uh, unfortunately, it's just that a lot of that data is uh, proprietary and I'm not allowed to share that. Um, but so this, this one that we're doing with the DFO, um, it's, it's sponge reefs. Uh, we're going to expand that to, to corals. Uh, and then I'm doing some work in Australia where I'm hoping to get more data on the corals too. Um, it's, it's one target that we have wanted for a while, but we haven't done a lot of work yet. Um, we've done more actually with our lasers in the corals than, uh, than the imaging. Um, how do we make it more accessible? Uh, I'm lucky enough that I get to work with academic institutions um, and we uh, do a lot of partnerships and we do a lot of um, grants and, and, and partnering grants with academic institutions. Um, so I think that's one of the best ways to, to access our systems. Um, uh, I've partnered with universities in, in Canada, uh, universities in the UK, um, uh, even we've, we've tried to apply for some of the states as well, um, looking for grant opportunities that will allow us to uh, get funding to, to take these expeditions. Um, that's one way. And then uh, another way to help us kind of support um, smaller developing countries and, and just academic institutions in general is um, depending on the project and if it's beneficial to both uh, providing loaner systems or, or heavily discounted systems, um, we, we do that as well. Um, and I'm, I think it was there a third part of the question. Uh, it's not on the screen anymore. So I may oh, have. I'm sorry. I think okay. Oh, there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, are you open to partnerships? Yes, we're, we're always open to partnerships. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the time, unfortunately, working with uh, companies and private institutions and everything is, uh, we don't always get access to the data. Um, so though we provide the sensors and collect uh, really good data and get really good feedback, um, a lot of the time the data is not, uh, can't be shared with us or only limited uh, images or data sets can be shared. Um, and so because of this, though we've done some really high profile wrecks, um, we've done stuff in, in Australia, um, kind of all around the world, uh, what we can share publicly is, is limited. When it comes to partnerships and funding opportunities and grants, uh, it's nice because a lot of that we can and will be able to release to the public. Um, so we, yeah, we are always looking for partnerships because uh, 
we get something out of it and the user gets something out of it too. Um, for us, it's, it's data to, to be able to share and analyze and improve our systems. Um, we always want to improve the technology. Uh, and one of obviously the best ways to do so is to uh, get data from the end users that we can uh, analyze. Um, we can analyze how our algorithms are working, how the hardware is working, what we can improve on in different environments. Uh, but if we don't get that data from the end user, um, uh, we do a lot of testing up here and uh, in the Great Lakes and, and sometimes in the oceans up here, uh, it would be in the oceans of Canada, but it's, it's very uh, limited in terms of the same kind of environment. Uh, we want environments all over the world. Um, that's really going to help improve. So partnerships uh, are one of the great ways to do that. So yes, we are. So if you want, um, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Uh, I don't think my email address is on that slide. I should have added it. Um, it might be the, the invite, but it's just Brendan, my first name, at volius.com. Yeah, we um, can provide it to any of the attendees. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and then I'll get to this next one. How much is the power consumption of the entire system, including illumination and imaging camera? Uh, I'll, I'll provide you with that after, uh, only because it's variable. Um, so uh, it's variable based on a couple of different factors, um, obviously the, the sensor itself, so whether it's our smaller one or bigger one, and then uh, kind of as you touched on uh, the illumination, um, though we have capacitor banks in the LED panel, um, you can uh, see a higher, uh, higher levels of illumination take more. Uh, and then it also comes down to how you're using the system um, so that the frequency in which you're taking images, the frequency in which you're pulsing the LED. So there are a couple of different factors that go into that, but uh, I think I have your email address and I can send you a follow-up on that um, of kind of different, it'll essentially be of uh, different ways of using the system, a couple of different examples of that, uh, different frame rates and stuff and different light output, um, how much power gets pulled. Um, but it's, it's uh, very reasonable um, for it to be on long duration missions uh, is not unheard of. And like I said, we save some power because of the capacitor banks and the LED um, that charge up. So, um, but it, it is um, variable depending on the application and a couple other factors. So it's uh, not necessarily an easy one to always answer. So the next question is, what is the power level of the illumination? Yeah, yeah, same kind of, I'll, I'll touch on that one. It, it kind of touches on the same thing that was uh, I was just touching on. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that afterwards, um, provide you a, a little bit more information with that um, on kind of the variable rates. And uh, yeah, like I said, it depends on the LED panel being used because we've got 1632 uh, on the, the Remus 3000 that's being delivered to scripts. We've got even more than that. Um, so it depends on how it's being used, the, the output power. Um, so if you're doing full efficiency or if you're only doing partial, um, the strobe rate, um, the capture rate. So uh, yeah, there's a couple of different factors that go into it. Um, and I'll, I'll send you more information on that for sure. And there's another uh, question from the registration and that is, is there a way to do simple photo mosaics with a basic setup of camera, laptop and software? What are the minimal, minimum technical specs? Sure, I fully comprehend the question, but I, I'll like I'll uh, I'll do my best. Um, so yes, uh, as a uh, as a short answer, um, obviously you've got to input the data into a photo mosaic and software. So uh, as I mentioned, we don't provide the the mosaic in or photogrammetry software. We provide the data that you can then input in there. Um, that that software is uh, can be loaded onto yeah, any any laptop from what I know there's a there's a couple different options that you can use out there um, some very good ones um, our system all you would do is uh, pull the data set from the the hard drive on the vehicle um, and then just feed that data set directly into the mosaic and software um, which will then do its thing and, and process it and, and spit out a mosaic um, the, the processing sometimes depending on the size of the data set can take a little bit um, a way to aid the efficiency as I mentioned is if the vehicles have uh, positioning data on board um, so an INS or DVL we can geotag our images uh, and that really speeds up the process uh, because obviously it knows exactly where each image was taken individually, uh, as opposed to potentially doing it sequentially uh, or trying to find the, the similarities in the images. Um, so, so yes, it can. Uh, I mean, sometimes you might need a better computer depending on the size of the data sets. Uh, and that's kind of the big factor. Um, some of the data sets can be rather large if you're looking at a, a large area, um, thousands of images. Um, 
So it can take a little bit longer. It takes a bit more processing power. So uh, depending on the computer I have, it'll be uh, a bit longer. But yeah, most most laptops can at least run a version of uh, a Mosaic in software. So another question from the Q and A is: What is the max range you could do? Um, yeah, so uh, we've got a couple different systems. We've got our Observer Pro, um, which is our bigger one. Uh, typically, it's deployed from bigger uh, bigger vehicles, um, larger ROVs and AUVs. So uh, AUVs like the Hugan size and something like that. Um, it's a little more power hungry, so you want a um, a, a bigger battery on board. Um, that one's about 15 meters, 10 to 15 meters max gain, uh, max imaging range. And that's once again, kind of dependent on environmental conditions. Um, we touched on turbidity and everything like that. Uh, and then we have our observer, uh, micro, which is the one that Scripps uses on the, this 200 or the, the 100 and the, the 600 vehicles. Um, and that one's about seven meters range, um, less power hungry, uh, smaller, more compact sensor. Um, so it's easier to integrate in some of the smaller vehicles. Another one from registration was, have you considered using computer vision to aid in navigation, i.e. along a feature or pipeline? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually something uh, we do already. Um, I mean, it's something that's done with our data, I should say. Not necessarily that we do it, but so uh, one of our sister companies, uh, IVA, which does the software, they do the navigational stuff and everything. Um, that is something they do. So they feed our data into real time. And, and I think I touched on the, um, the presentation talking about how we enable autonomy. That is one of the ways we do it. We feed our data in real time into the, uh, the machine learning process. So sometimes they'll have what they call IVA on board. And, and IVA is just one of the examples. There's a, a lot of companies that can do this. Um, and, and then they can utilize that data to make image or, uh, make decisions. So uh, you touched on it, an AUV following a pipeline uh, as our image data for, for multiple purposes. Um, one being obviously to uh, aid the, the vehicle alignment. So to ensure that it's continuing to follow the pipeline, um, but two, to, to do things like anode detection and stuff like that. Um, and then, so this is something that uh, we're trying to explore in, in other avenues as well. So stuff like um, under, underwater mine detection with the militaries uh, and then kind of the ocean science space, um, species identification, uh, fish, coral, stuff like that. Um, so it's it's definitely possible to do. Um, machine learning processes, some of them can take uh, a little bit of time and, and large data sets to train, um, to know what to identify. Uh, so there, there are um, some limitations sometimes, but as I mentioned, uh, some of the work that Southampton is doing, uh, hopefully will alleviate that and uh, bring in new processes that um, are far more efficient with how the, the machine learning happens uh, using the, uh, the image sets. Um, but yeah, so it, it is something that can be done. Um, like I said, we don't do it, but we provide the data and that's how they, uh, they analyze it for those kind of tasks. Thanks, so uh, let's see. Last question, I think, is can you talk a little bit about career opportunities in this field? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for our field specifically, I mean, uh, we're very, very open to um, bringing in people, especially who have uh, knowledge in the uh, the ocean science, the marine uh, underwater space. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we pull out a lot of our engineers um, and our talent from University of Waterloo. Uh, and it's, it's the good and the bad. Um, one, I mean, it's, they're great. Uh, University of Waterloo is highly touted. The, the people we get out of there are amazing, um, but typically they won't have specific uh, underwater, um, they won't necessarily have underwater experience, um, whether it's ocean science or, um, so we actually work with people all over the world. We've got um, one of our main engineers is in Australia. Uh, we've got people in British Columbia, which for us is on the other side of the country. Um, We've got people in the middle of the country, we do remote. So uh, we're very open to exploring um, people who are interested. Uh, I think we have actually might have a couple of job postings now, but um, myself, I never uh, imagined I would be in the underwater space at first. I, I just liked uh, robots and, and cool technology, um, doing uh, electromechanical engineering um, and, and found this company in Waterloo. And now it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's one of the coolest things doing kind of underwater robots and stuff. So uh, yeah, if, if you're interested, by all means, reach out to me and I can um, maybe give you a little more insight. Um, give you information about our company, but other companies within our group who uh, who are doing some really cool stuff or just other companies in the industry. I, I deal with um, a lot as uh, Vanessa knows, uh, OI Americas is gonna be in San Diego in two weeks time. I'll be there for uh, for that. 
and some of the, the the cool stuff you'll see there of all the different companies who are for technology. Um, it's a really cool space to be in. It's 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 also very nice because uh, though it seems like it'd be a big, uh, big industry, it's a very uh, it still feels very small. Where you'll see the same people at all the events, or you'll be working with someone who uh, in in California who's working with somebody halfway across the world on a similar project or or collaborating. Um, so though it, it seems like it'd be kind of a big space, it's actually kind of a, a, a nice small industry. And uh, so yeah, if, if you're interested, reach out or, or I'll be there in, in two weeks time if you want to meet up too. Well, thank you, Brendan, again, for uh, your insights on your technology and the camera systems, really remarkable. And um, we're bumping up to the, to the top of the hour. So um, thank you to all the to participants. And if you have ideas for future talks, please reach out to uh, Vanessa. Kenan or myself, and we can get them on the agenda. Douglas, just to make sure, um, I I don't know if I've got all the email addresses of the participants um, who are who are invited. Um, if you can, I would uh, like to get the the email addresses of the individuals who ask questions, so I can make sure to follow up. Sure, we'll we'll make sure you get that information. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend.